Behind me here is a picture of my 83-year-old great-grandfather who's working in his tree farm in South Korea. What is a tree farm, you may wonder? Well, as you walk across the city of London and see these great uh, trees that you see gracing our pavements, they are beautiful to look at, symmetrical. Well, have you ever wondered where they actually come from? Well, they come from places like these, where people like my grandfather would look after them, cultivate them and prune them with expert care to make sure that they look aesthetically beautiful. As you can imagine, moving around trees all day and cutting limbs are actually rather difficult physical labour. And why would an elderly man such as him, with five children and eleven grandchildren, probably all far more physically suitable than he is, still be doing this task? Well, the simple fact of the matter is, none of them want it. Similar parallels can be drawn from the British agricultural scene today, where no young people are actually joining the farming industry. Our statistics show that actually, a mere 3% of our farming population now is under the age of 35 years old. 3%. And this has been this way since 2003, and since then, the average age of the British farmer has been increasing to the point where now is lying at 59 years old. What will we do in just 10, 20 years' time? Well, why is this the case, we must wonder. British agriculture is very productive, our land is fertile, and we have the second greatest agricultural research in the entire world. Sure, there's going to be societal and cultural reasons, of course. I mean, to a young modern-day generation in the developed world, the agrarian lifestyle won't be as interesting as urban city life. Yet, it's important to understand there are going to be financial reasons here as well, and the agricultural scene can still be so financially unrewarding. That becomes more apparent the more you look into this sector. Consider our food prices. Nobody likes when our food prices rise. It's tangible, it's noticeable, and everybody hates it. Yet, did you know there's a great disconnection between the amount of money we pay for our food in the supermarket and what the farmer will actually receive? This gap between retail and farm gate prices has been growing over the years. And there are now cases where farm gate prices fall, even though our retail prices rise. Certain farmers even claim supermarkets are able to keep prices low through exploitation to a certain degree. A case study is of a farmer who had his entire crop rejected one year because he complained about the low prices. Then another supermarket chain swooped in conveniently and offered to buy his entire produce about half the price. Every single time you or I walk down the supermarket aisles and find those wonderful buy one get one free deals that I know I leave by the chance to buy, have you ever wondered who actually pays the brunt of the cost for those? Actually, many farmers claim that they do. As farmers are so incapable of actually making money on their produce, their income has to be heavily subsidised by subsidies. This actually has gone to the point where a British farmer's income can be supplemented up to 60%, and this cost the UK £2.4 billion last year. Not only is this a drain on the economy to a certain degree, more importantly, subsidies, unfortunately, promote mediocrity for farmers. As what incentive is there for a farmer to innovate, to be more productive, and help the development of British agriculture when he doesn't make money on what he produces? Now, also, unfortunately, subsidies tend to go to those who need it the least, as the bigger farms will naturally have more entitlements and can reap enough subsidies to survive the low farm gate prices, whereas the small, medium-sized farmers who need it the most, <coughs> not so much for them. This isn't just a problem in the United Kingdom, by the way. This is a problem all over the world. The United States, for example. Did you know the top 10% of US farmers took $166 billion in the last 10 years? $166 billion. This is while 62% of their farmers took absolutely nothing at all. Our situation in the UK is nowhere near as dire as this. However, the US offers us a great example of what we should not let our system spiral down into. Maybe this makes it sound as if the large farmer has it better off. Well, over the years, we can see the trend that British farmers have been increasing their land size. And since the 1980s, the ethos for British farmers, or any farmer, has been get big or get out, where if you can't pour more capital on your farm to buy more land, buy more animals, and buy more machinery, you would not be able to survive. Yet where is this capital actually coming from? Well, actually, all the way back into 1999, Already back then, 64% of our farmers had to borrow money to stay in business. And this debt has accumulated to the point where now, the farming debt has reached 16.9 billion pounds, an enormous amount for agriculture. 
Now why would a farmer put so much money and get into so much debt to just keep his farm afloat? Well, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, I'd like you all to put yourselves into the shoes of a 44-year-old farmer for a moment. At a 44 years old, you probably have family, children, responsibilities, and you've been farming from what, since you were 18, 20 years old? Considering this, how transferable is your set of skills as a farmer to a different industry, may I ask? Not very. The agricultural scene is shrinking, you'll be hard pressed to find employment there. And you no longer are an independent under 30 year old who has no family to look after. That career is shut to you, most likely. All of a sudden, get big or get out doesn't seem to describe the situation very well. It seems more apt to call it get big and in debt, or out unemployed. Oh, and by the way, the number of farmers who are over the age of 44 in the UK? This is 86% of our farming population. We are not talking about a few individuals here. I want you to stay in these shoes for a little bit longer, people. And just, just because I want to highlight to you how unpredictable this industry can be at times. You own 50 hectares of land, and you grow eight tons of wheat a hectare, about the British average for both figures. And with this, in 2008, when your wheat prices were at an all-time high, you would have made a profit of about 16,000 pounds on your crop, give or take a few hundred. Yet just one year later, 2009, wheat prices fell, and global energy prices soared, meaning that your crop input costs rose dramatically. That year, your crop you worked so hard to grow would it give you a net loss of 17,000 pounds or more? And is it any wonder why young people are not being attracted to this industry? I appreciate I've painted a rather bleak picture to, uh, to you so far. However, we must understand the differences can be made. Why is it that we are paying farmers so little for the actual food that they cannot actually make money from it? Maybe this means the gap between farm gate and retail price needs to be reduced a bit, but I believe we, as a general public, must also change our perception of food prices a little bit. We in the UK, did you know, spend the second lowest proportion of our income on food than anywhere else in the entire world. Only the USA spends less than us. Our neighbours in Greece, France, Germany, Italy all spend a good 2 to 8% more than we do. This may sound like a lot to some, maybe it sounds like a little, but remember, small changes are important. Consider our dairy crisis last year, in 2015. Farmers poured milk down the drains because their milk was being valued cheaper than water. What averted this was for them to receive a seven pence increase per litre. Seven pence, so that they would not operate at a loss anymore. Let us not underestimate what changes in perception and what small differences can do on a collective basis. When we finally create an environment where farmers can make money from what they do, an honest living, then maybe we can actually remove subsidies altogether. It's going to be difficult. It's a challenge, but it's been done before and successfully. In New Zealand in the 1980s, they removed subsidies altogether. And people feared a mass farming exodus would take place, but actually, only 1% of farmers left. Meanwhile, in the UK, we're in a situation where apparently 49% of our dairy farmers are set to leave the industry, and we have a subsidized system. New Zealand farmers became more productive, innovative, efficient, generated new streams of revenue, cleaned up the local countryside, promoted rural tourism. And through this, New Zealand's agricultural scene is now stronger than before, and it takes up a greater share of the GDP than ever before. There's a bright potential future for the agricultural world out there, people say. Developing countries with rising populations that desire an ever more westernized diet provide us with new market opportunities like never before. Many other nations have been taking full advantage of this. The US, for example, 2013, the exports rose to a tremendous $140.9 billion. The Netherlands, our neighbours, have an 85 billion euro worth of agricultural exports. So do Germany. Their exports have doubled in the last 10 years. In the UK, agriculture is our fourth largest export, valued at 12.3 billion pounds. It's not a terrible statistic, but it could be so much more. I mean, over the decades, we have slowly removed ourselves from the image of poor quality food, well, somewhat. And we, now, we have so much products that we can offer the world now. We have Cornish clotted creams, West, uh, West Country beef, Cumberland sausages, Silton cheeses, Scotch whiskies, just to name a few of the wonderful things we have with a British stamp on it that we can offer the world. There's a bright potential future out there. We just need to look at home and allow ourselves to create a sustainable environment for farming. <coughs> to actually create a system where young people want to come and farm, 
to actually reward farmers for productivity and innovation and let them make a fair living from what they produce. And maybe then, we in the UK can take our rightful place as leaders of this global future agricultural scene. Thank you.